Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Gong Lab, Gong Labs Live, episode number four, where you're going to learn how to build a bulletproof business case that gets executive buyers to say yes. So before we get into this one, I would love to see who's new here, who's not new, who's slowly becoming a raving fan. Comment below with the number of episodes you've seen before. We only have four of them. So I'm sure a lot of you, sure a lot of you are new. If you're new, comment that you're new below. If you're not new, let us know how many episodes you've seen. So last week, I was actually not here, and Devin took care of all of this himself <laughs> with a partner in crime. Tell us about that. Give us yeah. a quick recap from last week. Sure. So last week, we had uh, Tanner Robinson, uh, who went from SDR to SDR manager, now to AE, all here at Gong. And we covered uh, the best ways to handle objections. And some of the key takeaways were both on the kind of psychological front, and some are just simple best practices, what you can say and what not to say. Yeah. So if you were on that episode, comment that you were. What did you learn? Tell us a little bit of a snippet, a tactic that you've tried on your sales calls as far as handling objections more successfully. Also, we had a highly successful webinar yesterday. We had almost 3,000 people sign up for it. If you were on that webinar, comment below. Tell us you were on it. Tell us just one thing you learned that you really liked. But I think that's kind of a good starter for us. Sure. I would love to get into it. Like I said, we're going to be talking about how to build a bulletproof business case. The thing that you're going to get out of this is you'll get to the end of executive meetings and people are really going to want to move forward with your solution. You're going to become more confident as a seller. Buyers will have a heightened increase in confidence as you or in you. Oh man, I am tripping over my words <laughs> today. So bad. I'm glad there's not thousands of you watching this yet. But Devin, tell us what's the purpose of a business case? Absolutely, so the purpose of a business case is going to help elevate your conversation from what could be very tactical up to the executive level. And by that I mean you're gonna be more confident because you're going into a meeting knowing exactly what the business pain is that they're dealing with, what are the consequences of that pain, what is your solution, and how your solution specifically impacts that pain. If you have all that labeled out and you're speaking at the executive level, you're going to have a much more successful conversation and of course, a more successful close rate. So it seems like there are a few different elements to a successful business Absolutely. case. I would argue that the first one is you have to start with framing the problem really yeah, clearly. 100%. And I think you do that at different levels in the organization. Like there's a tactical way to frame the exact same business problem and there's a more strategic way. Yeah. So one of the examples that I like to talk about here at Gong is we often sell to both sales enablement who those people are a little bit closer to the front lines. Right. And we also sell to like a chief revenue officer or an SVP mm -hmm. of sales. Yep. And one of the business problems we occasionally solve is onboarding. Yes. So onboarding new hires. I can frame the exact same business problem tactically for sales enablement by saying Gong takes work out of your onboarding and helps you get you know, new reps up to speed faster, time to first deal, that kind of stuff. And that's gonna resonate very strongly with somebody who's in sales enablement. Yeah. If I took that frame though, and I positioned it for a CRO, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to frame it differently. It's gotta sound right. more strategic. I've gotta talk about getting expensive enterprise account executives up to full quota attainment faster. They don't care about reducing the amount of work during the onboarding process because they're not doing the work. They just want to see the numbers. Right. So I think that's kind of the first point is you've got to frame your problem right. Yep. Um, we also talked about, uh, you and I had this conversation offline about how a business case should sound. And we talked about, help me out here, where you're in like this meeting, this entrepreneurial sure. meeting. So, so here's how a business case sh should sound. If you get into an executive meeting and they are evaluating either a new venture or a new market, you will see some specific things happening in that conversation. They're evaluating the business opportunity, the market, the total addressable market. That's how your business case should sound. Yeah. If it's, it's yeah. I would say it's almost, I don't know if you guys, you watch Shark Tank? Yeah. I'm a big Shark Tank uh, watcher. And what I've noticed is every time I'm watching it, other than just for the entertainment factor, I like to watch how the entrepreneur presents their product or their company, right? The best ones start with the problem. Yep. They go through some sort of demo where, you know, they're struggling to do something. It's so, you know, so crazy. And then what they get into are some of the financials, those quick things that the, that the sharks ask if the entrepreneur doesn't start with, which is how big is this problem? Who was the, you know, the TAM? Whose problem is this? And how can we solve it? 
And if you go in that route, it makes a lot of sense why I would want to invest in this because you're starting with this problem, you're starting how you're solutioning it, right? And it starts to make more sense versus just saying, here's my problem or here's my solution rather. Yeah. What about ROI calculators? So a lot of people will ask, are ROI calculators or is proving ROI the same thing as a business case? What's your thoughts on that? I think they're different. I think an ROI calculator is a part of a business case. Um, before I dive into it, if you guys are using an ROI calculator, put yes or no right now. We'd love to know if this is something you guys are leveraging. Uh, in short, the business case is more of the, again, the problem, so it's the framing of the problem and the solution. Yeah. The ROI calculator fits into that of, okay, assuming we believe that this problem is true, the impact that you're going to deliver is also accurate, then what is some of the return we can make? And the reason why is, again, people in the trenches closer to the problem, they're more of the kind of the emotional thing, right? If, if I can get less, uh, less work uh, on my end, but get more back, that's enough for me. But the executives, they're more interested in, okay, what are we going to spend and what are we going to get back to justify this? And that's where the ROI calculator comes into play. The thing you need to be careful of, every ROI calculator favors the seller. That's yeah. why we use them. So you need to be mindful of not leveraging that exclusively because savvy uh, executives will see past that. Yeah. If you are using an ROI cal calculator, another question I would have for you is, do you think they work? So comment below, do you think the ROI calculators work? I think a lot of uh, people in the audience right now are probably wondering, or a question that's coming to their mind is we published this you know, really high profile post about mm -hmm. ROI and sales is dead, and how there's this massive correlation between pitching ROI and losing deals, which seems a little bit counterintuitive. And so I think that's worth talking about right now because when you look at a negative correlation between something that you think would work, which is proving ROI, what that tells me is there's probably three things happening or maybe one of three things happening. The first one is maybe ROI does not work. Could be. Okay, it backfires. Number two is most people are doing it so sophomorically or naively right. that it backfires. I yeah. think that's a little more likely than the first For one. For sure. And then number three, which is totally correlation and not causation, is reps are only pitching ROI as kind of like this Hail Mary attempt yeah. uh, to save a deal that's already like so far gone, they're just like trying to show right. them that they're gonna make money. So you've got A, B, and C. You've got A, which is it doesn't work. B, which is uh, most sales reps just don't know how to do it. And C, it's a big correlation causation thing. It's a Hail Mary. So comment below, which one do you think it most often is, is it A, B, or C? A, it doesn't work. B, uh, most reps just don't know how to do it. And then C, it's a correlation and causation thing. Now, one thing I learned from one of my mentors is you have to align your ROI pitch with how the customer values ROI. Yeah. And so one of yeah. the questions he taught me to ask when I was in sales is he would say, how do you plan on measuring ROI for this purchase. So if you're a salesperson, you ask that to your buyer. Yep. Now, one of the keys though, is a lot of times that they're not gonna know, they're not gonna have a good answer for you. And you've gotta have the answer for them if they don't. But if they do have the answer, now you can align your ROI pitch more closely to what they value. That definitely makes yeah. sense. <clears throat> and I think something else too is, you need to, the, the way you prepare this is kind of what you're touching on, right? Which is how are, you're asking ask questions of how are you um, viewing ROI. This is something that uh, business case is most likely gonna be built with your champions yep. and people that are closer to the problem. If you have access to the executive, of course you should be leveraging that. Use some of those discovery tactics that we've talked about and get more information from them. But it's not too uncommon to say, hey, we have, uh, you know, we're working with some of the people that are below the line, you know, below the line of authority and we need to start learning what matters most. So when you're building the uh, business case, you're building it for executives, but you're typically building it with people that are below the line. And they should be helping you uh, understand how they view ROI, what to do in that meeting, what not to do in that meeting. So that way you're having a successful conversation alongside good content. Yeah, another key to getting ROI right is who are you selling to? So the way you prove ROI to a sales executive or an SVP of sales mm -hmm. is very different than how you'd prove ROI to like a chief marketing officer or an HR executive. So tell us below, I would love to maybe even have a follow-up episode where we could address um, so some specific niche ways to prove ROI to different types of buyers. What type of buyer are you selling to? Uh, you know, is it like a sales leader? Is it a C-level executive? Just comment below right now. Tell us what kind of buyer you're selling to. And maybe if you want some extra credit, tell us how you think they measure ROI and whether or not that's working. Now, I know you have some interesting thoughts 
on where a business case yep. fits into the buyer's journey. Could you tell us that? Absolutely, and uh, we got some results back. People are saying from A, B, or C. People yeah. are saying B. So B. they're saying that people are not doing it very well. They're doing it sophomorically. I think it's both B and C. Yeah, I think, it's I think so, and so this should be helpful there. So I think there's, there's kind of two things that I've quote unquote coined that we were talking about, which is when this business case is used. Now there's your business case prompt, and then there's your business case proof. One is, more sh one is shorter, one is more in depth. Now when we're doing our business case prompt, this is the, maybe you've had two, three conversations, you haven't gotten to executive power for the most part, and so you probably have one or two slides, which is, I understand your need, I understand the pain, and I understand our solution and what we could do, but you haven't proven it out to a degree. So from there, that's a really good tool that you can use to say, hey, we need to align with your executive to make sure that we're right before we enter into either a POC, if you handle that, or the more in-depth you know, group presentation where it's kind of your, your one big shot, if you will. And so the goal here is you should, again, be using a call before that executive meeting to prep. Make sure, hey, does these, do these slides look right? Did I miss anything? Is there anything that we should add? And again, this is high level with the goal of meeting with that executive and saying, hey, here's the work we've done so far. I wanna get your, you know, your great uh, mind on this, make sure that it's accurate. And then of course, then you've earned the right to do some more discovery because in my experience, you're probably going to be missing a couple of things and it's yeah. a great leeway right into uh, you know, a couple other things you didn't know yet. Yeah, I think I want to add a little bit more color there. So Devin coined these terms, the business development proof and not business, business, business development, case, business yeah. case proof and business case decision. And both of those tools, uh, they serve different parts of the buyer's journey. So the business case prompt, it is a decision making tool for your executive buyer to decide if they even want to go into this buyer's journey. Right. They're maybe like at the top of a qualified opportunity or they just came into your pipeline or maybe they're even before your pipeline and they're either listening to your pitch or going over a business case deck that you put together and it is a decision making tool. They are evaluating, do I want to go on this venture? Mm -hmm. Just like they would be evaluating a new business venture. And that was, that's what I was trying to explain earlier, sure. which I explained so horribly, <laughs> is your business case should look like a proposal for a new business venture. Right. So that's at kind of the top of the funnel as far as the buyer's journey goes. Right. The other type that Devin's talking about is business case proof. Mm -hmm. And this is a decision making tool, not, they're not deciding do we want to pursue this venture or um, pursue the evaluation of this venture. They are deciding do we want to move forward. And so your goal there is, first of all, you're gonna have to be a little more in depth, yep. but there's a lot more of an emotional hurdle that you have to get past because now money's actually on the line right. and you've got to build ROI into that business or business case proof document or presentation or pitch or whatever it is. Yeah. So they fit in two parts of the buyer's journey. I would love to hear where you fit your business case pitch or presentation into your buyer's journey. Are you typically doing this at the beginning of the buyer's journey or at the beginning of the sales process to kind of entice people to come into your funnel? If that's the case, just comment below, say beginning. Or are you strictly using it as the end, as a decision-making tool to get an economic buyer over this you know, funnel, or not funnel, but um, emotional hurdle to finally move forward with your solution? So there are two different uses. Tell us if you're using both. Tell us if you're just using it at the beginning of the sales process. And if not, tell us if you're using it at the end to get them through and to help them make a final decision. Absolutely, and I think by doing it in both places, you kind of have this precursor with the prompt. They've seen it before, they have an idea of where you're headed. And so later when you come with more detail, it's like, oh, I've seen this before and they've done more work, there's more understanding here and it has more substance to it. And that's where sometimes like for us, we do run uh, POCs. And so you can have this uh, kind of high level, like what do the CEO, COO, VP of sales care about? And then you have the, um, the underlying things that each team, like for us, we sell to SMB, mid-market, enterprise last strategic teams. While all three of those have some shared commonalities and the value that your, our solution will bring, there's also gonna be some very specific nuances to each of them. So when you go to this business case proof and you have not only the overarching, but the very deep specifics for each team, then when you put that ROI calculator to it, it's not this grand thing of we're gonna bring you $5 million and it's kind of not very specific, right. but you see these key things that you can do for each team. It has that emotional and that rational uh, response to it. Now, if you've read the article we published a month or two ago about ROI and sales is dead, tell us below. I would love to see who has the context of that article and who does not have the context of that article. So just write below, yes, I read it or something like that. 
But one of the tips or tricks that I want to leave you with, which is included in that article, is instead of um, putting the cherry on top of your business case with an ROI calculation, a better way to do it is to use a before and after customer story, right. where you're outlining the before metrics, you're outlining the after metrics, mm -hmm. and the financial return is kind of built into that story. Now, the key to getting that right is your customer story has to reflect right. uh, your buyer situation. If it's totally not the problem that they're trying to solve, it's not going to hit the mark, it's not gonna do what you're hoping it's gonna do. But the beauty of telling a before and after customer story is now they can't ar argue with the assumptions that are in your ROI model. Right. If you're doing an ROI calculator, most of the time they're gonna be squinting at it and being like, you're making too big of a leap as Trying far to as, find holes yeah, to poke it, in it's it. just too yeah. big of a leap. So before and after customer story, it's a great way to remove that argument of uh, too big of assumptions in your ROI model. And also telling stories activates the right part of the brain. It gets people a little more emotional. They're just looking at somebody else's story. And if it happens to mirror their situation, that's all the better. Absolutely. And just like we like to talk about what to do, we also talk about what not to do. And so for you folks in the audience, are you presenting your ROI calculator, your business case, or are you sending it over via email? You can probably tell by my tone, I have a preference. I say always, always, always send it. No, I'm just kidding. You need to present it every <laughs> single time. The reason being is this isn't something that you're just giving, you're putting work into it. It's a mutual document. It should be a mutual presentation as well. And so by sending it over, you're kind of just giving them the ability to poke holes when you're not there. There's gonna be questions and you're not gonna be there. You're doing yourself a huge disservice by just sending it over email and trusting your champion, uh, even if they have the best intentions. And so always make sure that you're getting time with folks uh, to present it. Yeah, there's actually a book called Conversations That Win the Complex Sale. If you've read it, comment below that you've read it. If you have not read it, tell us that you will promise reading it or put it on your <laughs> reading list or something because it's one of the better sales books out there and it doesn't get as much publicity as some of like the big names like Challenger Sale or Solution Selling. But the author, Tim Reister, and if he's watching this, you know he's probably not, but shout out to Tim. Um, great guy, he talks about using before and after customer stories. And he tells the story of a sales rep who's pitching to Ford. And he's telling this before and after customer story and it mirrors the buyer's situation perfectly. Like the problem, he outlines their current state, he goes through a few metrics and tells an after story of what the customer had achieved. And according to him in that story, the executive who's in charge of making this decision just stood up and said, we'll take two. And by two, like each one of these are worth like $200,000, so it was a big sale. So if you get your business case right, and before and after customer stories are a great way to do that, that is the kind of impact you can have on your buyers. You could get to, mm -hmm. to the end of your presentations with them, and they're just kind of like, look, I'm sold. Yeah. Let's move forward here. Yeah. You'll yeah. feel the barriers go down of that uncertainty or that doubt. If you've done it correctly, they're pretty much either showing you their cards or you've earned their partnership. Uh, something came in as well. Yes, you can send it. You can send it, but only after you've presented it. Yes. Then you can sell it, send it over because what's going to happen is oftentimes if you don't get the, hey, Chris, this is amazing. Let's buy now. It's yeah. the typical, we're going to chat internally and we'll get back to you, which is not, whole not new the worst thing in the world. Yeah. Um, but what you can do is send, then you can send it over because what it's going to be, it's going to be your kind of like virtual presence when you're not in that room. When there's a closed door conversation happening, you can't be a part of it. That business case should be solid and should you know, kind of be their source of truth for their decision. Well, I think that opens up a whole new can of worms as far as like how you craft your business case because you have to think of it as um, this piece of content, if it is a piece of content, you know, usually it's gonna be like a presentation deck or PowerPoint right. or something. It has to serve two purposes. It has to serve as a presentation you're giving to somebody live, but it also has to serve as like a Trojan horse yeah. that you send on your behalf right. because a lot of conversations are going to have in, or happen internally in the buying organization without you there. And you want to make sure your business case deck can facilitate the right conversations that are gonna favor you. Right. And it goes back to some of the things that you and I talked about earlier, which is start with framing the problem because the number one question that is going through an executive's mind when they are presented with a proposal of a new business venture or a solution to move forward is they're thinking, what problem does this solve? Or right. what opportunity does this help us yep. exploit? 100%. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, folks, if there's any last questions, go ahead and put them in now. Uh, we'll take any questions. Um, should we kind of talk about uh, wrapping up here? And if we get questions, we'll handle them? Or? Let's get some Q&A going. 
Perfect. Uh, well, we're still waiting for them to come in. I guess another thing to consider too is while we're waiting for questions is, does your solution save people money or does it help them cut costs? Or no, yeah, make make revenue or cut costs. It can be a little confusing. Yeah, there's sometimes. two like broad ways that you can prove business case and you do have to get a little bit more nuanced, but does your solution help the customer increase revenue or make money or decrease costs? So you tell us, we, I wanna see which one um, is more common among salespeople. Does it decrease costs or does it help people make money? Uh, one of the questions I've heard people ask about business case are, is what, is, what are some of the mistakes that you can make in pitching ROI? Yeah, and we've yeah. talked about some of those. Um, one of the ones that I would like to address right now is just making a too big of a leap mm -hmm. between the expected financial return you can help your customer get and what your product can actually do. So it's like, you know, if you sell a widget that lives on somebody's website and you're like, pr you're promising like a 300% year over year revenue growth, that's probably a little bit too big of a leap. But if you prove that this widget can increase conversion rates by X percent, and now you can tie that to leads and, you know, that kind of stuff and qualified opportunities, yeah. it's a little bit more rooted in reality. I, I think too, and I've had a lot of success on one of the larger deals in my career was, I took them through this journey of, hey, we can add conversions here, this part of your website, and conversions here and here. And we had this huge, like, it's kind of the same thing, like 300%, but I was like, let's not, let's not go to the nth degree. Let's take it super conservative and we cut it in a 10th. Yeah. And we said, if we still took a 10th of what we just showed you, even though you, you agree with me on every single step, we would still, and it was like a big slide, it was like $1.3 million is what we would return. So it was like hard to say no to that because we built it up so big and yeah. then took a very conservative approach, yeah. which I think people appreciate because again, they know the ROI calculator is gonna make you look good. So don't try to make it look the best or the largest. That's not always the most effective. Yeah. Well, it seems like we're coming up onto the end here. Yep, we have no questions, but it looks like a lot of love for the book that you plug. So someone's gonna get some Amazon purchases. Hopefully you get a uh, chunk No of affiliate that. commissions, <laughs> it's just out of the goodness of my heart. I really like the book. We have it on the shelf, which is behind the the videographer over there, but Conversations That Win the Complex Sale, really good book. In fact, somebody tag Tim Reister. If anybody knows him, just tag him in the comments below. I want him to see that we're shouting out his book. Again, we get no incentive for doing that. I just think it's a great and very underrated sales book. Fantastic. Well, folks, that's the episode for today. What you can do as always is find uh, the on-demand recording on our LinkedIn page. Make sure you go over to Gong's LinkedIn, click follow. We will very shortly have it up on YouTube and then we'll also be on your Apple podcast. So if you're someone who likes to listen to podcasts, to and from work, at the gym, etc., you'll be able to see Gong Labs live there very soon. See you next time.